Welcome to the Assembly of Silence Radio Hour. And here we are. My guest this episode is Lonnie Jarrett, a well-known acupuncturist, teacher of Chinese medicine, author of Nourishing Destiny, the Inner Tradition of Chinese Medicine, and the Clinical Practice of Chinese Medicine. He's been a student of Chinese medicine since 1980, a graduate of the Traditional Acupuncture Institute, holds a master's degree in neurobiology, and is a fourth degree black belt in Taekwondo. He maintains a clinical practice in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and you can find information about him on his website at LonnieJarrett.com. The link will be in the show note description. I've known Lonnie for many years. I really admire his teaching style. He's someone who penetrates to the core of many important issues. I hope you find this conversation interesting. I'm sure you will. We did have a number of technical problems that kind of interfered with the flow of things. So I apologize for that, uh, but it is just the way it is. I was hoping originally that we would discuss five element theory, which is a fascinating lens through which to view really uh, much of what happens in the world. But because of a sense of urgency about what's going on in the world, and this was, of course, a few weeks before posting this episode, so uh, things have gotten even more urgent, you might say. And so the conversation took a, a different tack than what I was originally thinking. My hope is that uh, someday, God willing, uh, Lonnie will join us again to discuss five-element theory. But in the meantime... Uh, Here is a conversation on a subject which is one of the recurring themes of this podcast. How do we deal with what's going on? Particularly when what's going on is not what we would hope for, to say the least. And with that, I hope you'll enjoy this conversation with Lonnie Jarrett. It seems to me that the core of your teaching... Yes. Is elementally that we each have available to us in every instant the opportunity to abide in what might be called yoga traditionally, a state of being where there is no uh, attachment to the mind fluctuations. But at the same time, we have this corporal existence that's temporally conditioned and that uh, the, the wonderful thing about your vision of that is that that's not to be diminished, that it's not to be ignored. And so it's a spiritual, I think you refer to it as a integrated perspective where the spiritual and the, let's say material, or you know, the way I would think of it is the prenatal and the postnatal are inextricably integrated, they are linked. Form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. Mm. So they move towards each other. No, they are, they are just one and the same thing. They are just different faces of the same one thing. Right. So it, you could call them incommensurate opposites that couldn't exist without each other. Right. Ac- according to... Um, Buddhist principles dependently originating. Mm. You don't have one without the other. They're just they're just two faces of the same one thing, like yin and yang, day and night, good and bad, sad, sadness, joy and sadness. So you're teaching practitioners and students of Chinese medicine, and there's a statement that you made in uh, the class that I listened to that is, I think, really interesting. You say, what's the significance of curing Mr. and Mrs. Jones' sciatica at the moment in history when their species is threatened with extinction? And I think that right now, we're really on the kind of knife's edge of a major change happening in the world. And you can see it happening in so many different ways. But I'm wondering uh, in what way you might 
characterize where we are <laughs> and the right attitude to adopt towards moving forward. I feel a certain amount of urgency about that at this point. So um, you, you said a few things that I, I mean, you said a lot, so I can respond to a few things. So the first is that the five elements is one paradigm within Chinese medicine that allows us to understand the human condition in integrally, integrally in terms of ecological relationship and connection. And it is a lens we can look through that helps us to understand the dynamic interplay, interplay of forces as the individual is created and emerges in real time. So the five elements can be used constitutionally to understand a person's inborn strengths and weaknesses. And as with the progression in anything, the, the progression of understanding of the five elements throughout one's life is from the gross to the subtle. So as an analogy in music, I'm 63 years old. And when I was about 12 or 13, I learned the minor pentatonic scales and on guitar, and I was able to solo with them. And 50 years later, I can still use them to solo, but what I'm playing is of an entirely different order. And similarly, I learned the five elements in 1980. I took my first 10 week class on five element Chinese medicine. And I have been contemplating and looking through the five elements as, as one worldview, as one worldview for 42 years. And, and my capacity to under, to see through that lens just continues to deepen um, and take on greater nuance. So the five element system can afford us an understanding of a person's inborn capacities and how those capacities are interacting with the weather. And the weather is a metaphor for movements of qi. And when qi moves outside of us, we have the daily light cycle and we have weather and we have seasonal change. And when she moves inside of us, we have thought, feeling, emotion, and sensation. And thought, feeling, emotion, sensation, and all of the cyclic changes in the world around us are objects in the awareness of a witness that never moves. And that is Hmm. that is significantly free of the changes that are cyclically occurring. So bringing that up to date to the end of what you brought up is, I agree with you that we are at a critical point in history. And while it has always looked, no, every generation, as long as there was a hominid on earth with the capacity, some capacity to think and to assess their situation. So, Well, for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or possibly even 150 or 100 million years, it has probably looked to hominids and human beings as though we were facing that the species, that the individual and the species were facing existential threats. We never really had the capacity before in history to significantly destroy most human life on earth. And I think the thing that differs now is we actually do have that capacity. I right. I am reasonably sure the earth and the biosphere will survive with or without us in, right. <laughs> until the planet no longer exists. Mm-hmm. And I think what it, what is in question as you allude to is the continued fruition of the human race and its capacity to realize, to continue to realize higher evolutionary potentials. Of course, under significant stress, 
human beings tend to regress to much lower levels of development. We see that, you know, in, in, you know, iconically and mythically in movies like Mad Max or The Walking Dead. And of course, we sure. see, see that in, in, a, in a book like Lord of the Flies. And so I, I think what's our question here is really, I think we have two, two waves cresting here. And one is the, the damage done to the biosphere by the deficient mental, rational, material level, materialist, materialism, mental, rational, materialism, having been absolutized into a ultimate form of consciousness and ultimate worldview since Descartes and the destruction of the biosphere, the repression of the unconscious, the repression of the feminine, the repression of the body, the repression of sexuality, the repression of um, intuition in, in the name of mental rationality. So this is one wave. And on the other hand, at the leading edge of human development, <clears throat> there is a relative enlightenment and integrality that transcends the limitations of all previous forms of consciousness and has a vast capacity for understanding systems within systems within systems. And we can bring this mm. all around as the geniuses who wrote the Neqing, the Nanqing, the Ling Chu, the early, the early thinkers in Chinese medicine had a capacity at least to understand systems of systems. They, they, they had a very highly evolved capacity to understand systems of systems. They weren't really at an integral stage of consciousness. Um, but they certainly were at a holistic stage of awareness where they understood um, the this, this subtle and delicate balance of um, the relationship between the human individual, family, tribe, and culture, and its delicate relationship to the biosphere, let us say, um, cosmological influences. Uh, it, it's it strikes me that you have a particularly um, like humanist anthropocentric kind of uh, uh, vision of development, and I'm wondering if we might place this within a framework that's maybe a little bit more generalized in the sense that uh, we see that crises within systems have occurred periodically on planet Earth prior to uh, humanity, and that the uh, organizations and institutions of humanity likewise have these kind of periodic periodic rises and falls and that you could think and I think you mentioned actually which is really wonderful because it's something that I've always thought was likely that the five elements can be thought of as a descriptive uh, symbolic system for essentially thermodynamics that it's the um, you know particular forms of energy which are attuned to their circumstance that um, sort of rise up, take advantage of the circumstance, have a byproduct which eventually becomes difficult to manage and which sets the conditions for uh, the, the necessary transformation of the material world into something entirely different, which you could think of as being a way of describing the rise and fall of various species and the changing of the biosphere. So I wonder uh, what you have, what thoughts you might have on that kind of perspective of it. Yeah, I haven't really thought about what I'm teaching as being specifically anthropocentric, except for the fact that given the state of the world and as much as I am intrigued by and respectful of dolphin intelligence, I think we would be remiss to sit around and wait for them to solve the problems. <laughs> They're not causing the problem, <laughs> but I, I, I don't see them solving any. And in terms of thermodynamics, I appreciate that, yes, certainly there's a thermodynamic aspect to the five elements, although the five element, but that thermodynamic aspect has gross, subtle, and very, very subtle dimensions to it. Gross means material and waking life. Subtle means psyche and soul and more dreaming life. 
And very, very subtle means more like causal, which is more witness, non-dual, and and spiritual life. Like so, we have a distinction here that in Chinese phys- every phrase in Chinese physiology has a gr- a gross, a subtle, a very subtle, a uh, physical, a psyche, soul, and a spiritual dimension to it, all simultaneously arising. In terms of thermodynamics, I really tend to think of the system in Chinese medicine called eight principles as being much more relatively thermodynamic. However, I want to make a distinction, which is the five elements, the char- Chinese character for element is Xing, and, it's the, and that character translates It's been translated into English as element, which maybe isn't the best translation. Monfort Porker translates it as evolutive phase, because really element Mm. gives you an idea that water, wood, fire, earth, metal are discrete. And really, we would want to picture the five element cycle as rotating so fast that the colors blend into each other, almost like a rainbow. Um, but what's interesting is that character for Xing element is also samskara. And samskara are the conditioned, uh, samskara is the conditioning of our past experience. It's the stored impressions, gross, subtle, and very subtle of past experience. And those, we can therefore understand the five elements as five samskaras or sort of five illusory spheres that consciousness gets trapped in. And we can understand consciousness as being the clear white light at the center of the circle, which is impersonal and incarnates out into that circle as one of the five elements, which is a person's constitutional type. And the person gets hooked into that wheel spinning so fast as fear and desire. So these are slides that you're showing are all from the handout from my five element course that I did. So the five elements are spinning and a person experiences their consciousness as trapped in the wheel and they're hooked into fear and desire. And the whole point here is it reduces a sense of having free will and a great sense of being victimized and pushed around by huge internal and external forces we're unaware of and don't understand. And really the whole point is to extricate ourselves from this wheel back to the center so we can experience thought, feeling, emotion, sensation, and whether in seasonal change as relative transformations out in the wheel that actually have no self nature. And while while we are certainly influenced by them, we can choose a position of freedom in relationship to them. I just sat, I just went to a Buddhist monastery, a Tibetan monastery up in, uh, j- just in the Catskills outside of Oneonta in Sydney Center, New York, Padma Same Ling Monastery. And I just meditated 48 hours in five and a half days, did an hour of Qigong a day. And a practice like that really helps to extricate one from the events of one's life. Yeah, that's an answer to the question I posed in the sense of like, what's the attitude that we should adopt to the transformations that are happening all around us? And you're saying that irrespective of what those transformations are and the degree of their magnitude, that this is the practice that addresses the circumstance. Well, I think it's very important to make a distinction that in the context of Hinayana Buddhism, which is the first turning of the Buddhist wheel, the foundation of spiritual insight and spiritual liberation would be to, as I said, extricate one from the experience. And the answer there would be from the Hinayana perspective, or even the perspective of the first few pages of the Bhagavad Gita, would be there is no doer, there is no deed, it's all an illusion. Let the world go to hell. This has happened a trillion times before. It'll happen a trillion times again. (laughs) (laughs) Just play your role. But from the perspective of the Mahayana, which is the second turning of the wheel, 
from the perspective of the Bodhisattva vow, we are um, summoned to be the doctor and the medicine and to forestall enlightenment and any notion of escape for the idea of um, alleviating the suffering of all sentient beings. And from a postmodern perspective, we can certain what they mean by sentient beings are any animal like an amoeba, a worm, a fly, a snake, a duck, a deer, a dog, a human being that that who has an existence um, of its own as opposed to plants. But I think from a post which are tied to rooted in the earth. But I think from a postmodern perspective, we can just include the biosphere and the whole world from a postmodern perspective, Gaia as a living organism, and mm. ex- understand, extend the Mahayana vow into environmental stewardship. Mm. So then what does liberation mean in that context? Because if I heard you correctly just now, you said that you would suspend the project of enlightenment. I, and I'm assuming that you meant sort of the personal uh, enlightenment of the Bodhisattva, the one who's returned. And so, but the liberation, would that not be an enlightenment itself? Isn't that basically what you're uh, seeking to achieve by that uh, by that vow? Well, the Hinayana view of liberation is I stepped off the wheel, I'm free, I can feel all circumstances spinning around me and I can see them objectively. And and the witness tells me they are not me and I am free and I'm free from karma and I'm not coming back. Have a good day. (laughs) And the, the Bodhisattva vow actually implicates us deeply, every one of us into each other's well-being and will return until all life on the planet is free of suffering. We can extend the Bodhisattva vow, as Teilhard de Chardin might have done, to not just coming back until all life on the planet is liberated, but coming back for eternity, or as long as it takes until all, all matter in the universe has woken up to itself as clear white light and divine and that's going to be a while for all practical purposes uh, yeah that's that's that that's definitely a, a a long-term project but it also presupposes uh a, a consciousness that's resident within all matter it, it well it presupposes the potential of consciousness within all matter and what it does is from a Western materialistic biomedical point of view, consciousness arises from matter. But from a contemplative subjective perspective, matter arises in a field of co-arises in a field of consciousness. E- even the the you know the core thinkers within the Western tradition uh, believed that themselves, and probably because they were exposed to the thinking from the East. But I know Max Planck considered consciousness to be fundamental. Yes, absolutely. Consciousness is fundamental, and matter is fundamental, and they co-arise together, and they can't be separated. Which, which is, you know, which is being and becoming, form and formlessness, emptiness and luminosity, are one and the same. So one of the things that you speak about is the the degree to which. Uh, consensual reality is dependent upon our common understanding of terms. And so, you know, what would be your definition of consciousness? It's one of those words that's incredibly slippery. It's used in so many different ways. Like how do you envision consciousness in a way that applies to every atom as well as to sentient beings? Right. Well, uh, so the thing is that consciousness has two capacities And those capacities are perceiving and choosing. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the teacup that I have, the matter in that teacup has next to no capacity to either perceive or choose. But that doesn't mean that there isn't consciousness in it. Well, that, that may not be the case. 
it, it may be the case that atoms have a predilection. I mean, obviously they sense their environment, which is a kind of perception. Right. And then they have a, a behavior that's exhibited. And now they probably don't think of themselves as a teacup. That's well, an imposition that we've placed upon them. They probably don't think of themselves. <laughs> see, 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 they may not think see, of themselves. They don't but, think of themselves. I mean, a one-month-old baby and a three-month-old baby don't think of themselves either. That ca the capacity to think right. of oneself begins to emerge with language. So I would say that the, you know, the matter in a teacup, the matter in my desk has proto-consciousness. It has the potential for consciousness mm -hmm. implicit, just as when, when you and I were two years old, we had the capacity to do algebra was implicit, but we weren't, but we weren't doing algebra. That, that had to evolve. But it could also be the case that uh, the matter in your teacup is just an incredibly dedicated form of consciousness that really just has, in essence, a, a capacity to perceive and to choose in the, in the way that, for example, uh, a protein would, would do. So cells also have this capacity to sense and, uh, and respond in a variety of different ways, but they're relatively circumscribed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the thing is that there's a big difference between a cell and the matter in a teacup. I mean, the difference between a cell and a matter in a teacup is something like 14 billion years of evolution. It's like literally 14 billion years of cosmic evolution, the difference between a single cell and the matter in my teacup. At any rate, I would see the teacup as existing in a field of consciousness and permeated by consciousness, mm. but consciousness, consciousness gains capacity in relationship to the complexity and integration of the structure that it's coming through. And as far as we know, the most complex and integrated structure we've discovered thus far in the universe is the human brain. Now, I would not exclude dolphin brains, and octopuses seem to have a tre absolutely tremendous capacity, probably uh, far beyond our suspicions mm. of what they're capable of, but for all practical purposes again, and to the degree my teaching is human-centric, I I don't call octopuses or dolphins for investment advice. <laughs> right. So the uh, the integration of the neural network, we could say that it's it's being recapitulated now within human society, and that uh, we have in the human body specialized organs which have been integrated through. Uh, uh, a neuron system, and that similarly, we now have a highly specialized society with uh, a ever more integrated information system. Uh, so, you know, one of the sure. one of the ways of characterizing the present dilemma is that we have a tradition of, uh, let's say, Western liberal thinking that has uh, certain ideals, such as uh, sanctity of the individual and freedom of choice. And at the same time, we have a more deeply integrated technocratic society that's starting to look a bit more like the nightmare of totalitarianism that we were all trying to avoid earlier in the 20th century. So in the face of these transformations, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on uh, what our attitude should be kind of more specifically uh, in, in, in relation to it. Well, I mean, you know, to discuss the what's playing out on the planet now in 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 terms of the rise of totalitarianism is simply that evolution goes in cycles, and postmodernism. The so so modernism got rid of God. Right, Nietzsche said God is dead, and. And modernism deconstructed um, the church and it deconstructed and repressed the church and it repressed magic. And 
Well, it, Nietzsche also yeah. said that this was going this was going to uh, undermine the foundation of Western society. So it's not that he necessarily declared God dead as a, in, in any sort of victory sense of that. He thought it was going to result in the collapse of, of Western uh, civilization. Well, it may result in the collapse of all civilization because materialism is certainly what's killing the planet. Mm. And then post postmodernism at the leading edge in the West has undermined materialism it has begun postmodernism is the beginning of the reenchantment of the world after the re- mental rational repression of the unconscious and nature and the feminine by modernism so you know Joni Mitchell sings we've got to get ourselves back to the garden which is a symbol of postmodernism beginning to reintegrate and reenchant the world but the problem with postmodernism is it deconstruct all it can do is deconstruct hierarchy. It can't construct hierarchy. So it deconstructs hierarchy. Right. It, and and yeah. which results in a cultural flatland. If you have your truth, I have my truth, nobody knows the truth. And it gives us a president like Obama, who, although I love the man, felt compelled to have to listen to the points of view of every everybody who wanted him dead <laughs> and and worked as hard as they could to thwart his entire agenda um well and and so you know obama obama is someone i, I think we would have uh, a, a a real disagreement about what obama really was i mean as much as i well, obama uh, appreciated obama what, was what obama he, was postmodern what whatever well, certainly. whatever he was he was postmodern and he was arguably our first postmodern president, although one could argue that Jimmy Carter was postmodern. Why would Carter be postmodern? Well, he, he had a very deep humanitarianism and, and very deeply, um, a very deep concern for civil rights. Carter also had an ecological worldview that was endemic at the time in terms of, um, you know, getting ourselves back to the garden. I mean, it was Carter who put in all the tax credits for passive solar construction and, and, uh, right. It seems though that if the, if the actual project of postmodernism is a critique that, uh, leads to a kind of moral relativism, then, you know, that that's a far more, uh, pure form of, uh, social transformation that, I mean, it, it's maybe a technical uh, disagreement that, you know, Carter would represent an older form of thinking, someone who is just made more of like a social progressive than a postmodernist. Because I do think that your analysis of postmodernism is correct, that it, it, it leads to, while the critique is actually uh, at times very insightful and incisive, mm-hmm it ends up where there's no clear sense of what anyone believes and it's all sort of, you know, uh, do your thing. It renders it impossible. So what you do in postmodernism when you have a problem is everyone sits in a circle and everyone listens as the least competent person speaks and the most competent person speaks. And then they look to reach the consensus, which means a solution where everyone will feel heard and that's not what we need. We actually need the best solutions. We need to reinstitute hierarchy. Well, but also that, you know, the the, the solution that everyone gets heard uh, never arises because there's always going to be, and this is one of the huge problems with the left, is that there's it's such a, a, a hodgepodge of different um, special interests, you might say, that you end up with everyone disappointed at the end of the well, day. Well, much of, much, much of the left is actually at a mythic level of development. And they're not, they're not postmodern at all. Because the, key fu- what, the two key fundamental features of postmodernism are what we talked about in terms of the hierarchy, deconstructing hierarchy. But the second is the capacity for holding pluralistic viewpoints, being able to consider many, many points of view and synthesize them and much, much of the left can't, you know, the whole, all of council culture is based on the unwillingness and inability to listen to points of view that one doesn't agree with. 
and any more postmodernists could do that, the people on the left who are posing as postmodernists are actually at best at mythic membership level of development, which is if I don't like what you say, you can't speak at the college campus. And that's, you know, right. mythic membership right. is mythic membership is you're in or you're out, you're with us, you're against us. Right. So you're referring to uh, something that you go into some depth in, which is the uh, difference between stages and states. Could you give us kind of an overview of that? I think that would be really helpful. Well, sure. So a lot of people don't have the distinction between states and stages of development. Right. So all of the all of the traditions, the great traditions, Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, Vedanta, and even the esoteric dimensions of Judaism and um, Christian religion, Sufism, all of those schema of development all have to do with the development of higher and deeper states, state awareness. So states come and go. So the nature of states is that they come and go. And at any stage of development, you can have any state experience. So an infant can have a non-dual experience. They just won't know it because they have no mind to know it with. Their non-duality is, is completely embedded. And likewise, a fully realized non-dual sage who's awoken can have an experience of needing to urinate or be hungry, which, which is a first chakra level survival instinct. So mm. states, states come and go. And the difference is that stages are permanent. When we talk about state development, which means um, doing contemplative and meditative practice meant to develop us and root us awaken us to deeper and higher states, we're talking about waking up. State development has to do waking up. Stage development has to do with growing up. Stages move in order and they're permanent. Once, you've, once you have the ability to, to you, your capacity to do math or your capacity to play piano doesn't come and go. You learn to ride a bike, you can always ride a bike. That's stage development. Those aren't state experiences. So stage development has to do with growing up. And the simple matter is that most people on the planet, the, the majority of human beings alive on the earth today, are their average leading edge is mythic membership, which is really a, a more or less a pre-personal stage of development, which means that they've assimilated into a membership collective, an ethnocentric membership collective. And that collective was more important than the individual. And self-actualization in that context just means becoming more and more and more a better member of the collective. And, hmm. and this is um, a fundamentalist embedded, culturally embedded stage of development where all of one's values are interjected into consciousness by the collective as the superego forms between the moment of first breath and maybe 12 or 13 years old, it completely concretizes between the age of 18 to 21. And most human beings on the planet, even if they live 70, 80, 90, 100 years, do not evolve beyond what they learned from cult, who, who they were and how life is from culture between by the age of 21. And they never question any of the fundamental assumptions that have been given to them by culture about the rules and roles of how to live. There's a way in which this is uh, done uh, intentionally. That society uh, has this conformity that it superimposes on people through cultural uh, avenues, and particularly now through the technology, the media technology, that uh, it is in some ways uh, 
countervailing to the project of the liberal enlightenment, which was to cultivate the individual and to encourage people to develop a, 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 their own understanding of things. Well, well, sure, but most of humanity hasn't made it to the enlightenment. <laughs> well, well, they haven't. They have most of the conflicts on earth are ethnocentric conflicts right now, where tribes are at war at each other, hacking each other to death with machetes. And the fact is that those cultures on their own merits never could have produced nuclear or biological or bio, biochemical weapons. But they can, right. they can, but they can use them. They can well, buy. The irony can, is is perhaps that them. you know. It, the irony is perhaps that the people who do have those capacities are the ones who had the tradition of uh, cultivating the individual and deepening rational understanding, which they then turned to the purpose of dividing the rest. And not all of them, you know, but but that was certainly one of the big projects. It's not quite that simple. Because, so when human beings develop, what develops first into each stage of development, most of the time is the cognitive line of development. And what really happened is people who were cognitively evolved into rationality and modernism, who were still basically at a membership ethnic stage of development, develop these weapons using the cognitive capacities of mental rationality, but they had never consolidate, integrally consolidated the self at that stage of development. So you, th you think that's an adequate des uh, description of someone like Oppenheimer? I actually haven't studied the man in depth, so I, I, I really can't. Speak. I can tell you that my uncle worked with him on the Manhattan Project hmm. and, and knew him very well. And my uncle didn't know what he was working on until he got the New York Times one morning and saw that a bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima. Wow. And, and he sat at the breakfast table gobsmacked, realizing that's what he had been doing the last three years. Wow. Because everybody was, everybody was cloistered. Everyone was just in groups of two or three people told to solve this problem. Right. Yeah. No, no, very, none of those guys working on it knew what they were working on. They were all just working for the government and given problems to solve. But they weren't in communication with anyone else. There, there, were some, there were some managers who oversaw the project who certainly understood what was going on. And there may have been some within the ranks who had there an inkling of it, but- Well, um, sure, sure. My uncle wasn't one of them. Anyway, I can tell you, uh, I don't know much about Oppenheimer, but I, I do think it's important to understand that it's deficient mental rationalism that, that is the greatest threat to the planet. Tribes have been hacking each other to death with machetes probably for, uh, or the equivalent of machetes for millions of years. And of course, the concern is uh, deeper. The, that term, deficient mental rationalism, really is is very resonant. Can can you give me a kind of zoom in on the on how it's deficient? Like, what exactly is the problem with this rationality? Okay. Yes. Well, let's understand. One second. Let's understand, please, that. Um, the way the evolution of consciousness works is that when any form of consciousness is turned into an absolute principle, it um, starts to produce problems that only the next higher form of consciousness produces. So when you absolutize a form of consciousness, it begins, the translations of the worldview it produces begin to fail. And the only answer is to be able to look down on that form of consciousness from the next highest form. And then as we move into the new consciousness, it solves the problems of the previous consciousness. Mental rationality solved the problems of witch trials. It solved the problems of eating albinos to cure disease. It solved the problems of 
clitorectomy. I've uh, never heard of that one before. Clitorectomies for 12 year old girls. There are tribes in Africa who believe the way you cure AIDS is to have sex with a virgin. It cured the problems of, ma- of deficient forms of magic and deficient forms, uh, uh, literal mythic forms where a person of consciousness, where a person believes that what is in the religious text is literally true. And we have mythic literalists in Chinese medicine who read the Neqing, who believe that when the Neqing says, when you enter the clinic, close the doors and windows and illumination will, uh, spiritual illumination will appear. What they think that means is that literally the acupuncture should close the physical door and window to their practice, as opposed to it being a metaphor for closing the sensory orifices so that the light of inner illumination arises a spirit intersubjectivity between patient and practitioner. So, so mental rationality solved the problems of deficient magic and then when mental rationality and materialism are absolutized into a point, a single point of view, the universe, bec- into an ultimate point of view, the universe becomes a world of surfaces with no interior dimension, soulless, just soulless. And then you look at redwood forests and you just sit down and do the math to figure out how many picnic tables you can get out of them and, and, and what they'd be worth. And, right. and that's what we're suffering under now is deficient mental rational. Um, postmodernism transcends and includes mental rationality to, to bring in pluralism and um, to, to start to re-enchant the world. But its deficient form is cancel culture and lack of hierarchy and well, you could also say though the the, at- the attachment to to thought objects isn't solved by introducing more thought objects like incre- increasing the diversity and the number of thought objects that we become attached to isn't going to solve the problem well, well the evolution of consciousness doesn't have to do with increasing thought objects it has to do with increasing objectivity and an increasing increasingly extracting consciousness from the material, increased objectivity so that this, what was the subject becomes the object. And then in, the direction mm. of the evolution of consciousness is an increasing, ever increasing embrace of other as self. It has nothing to do yes. with thought objects. That's a a set of ideas that I think we could unpack a little bit because it does get a little confusing when you talk about increasing objectivity with respect to objects. You know, in a way, objectivity is is uh, loosening the ties to objects. No, right? No. Well, loosening the ties of consciousness to objects, but as consciousness becomes loosened from objects. It can scrutinize those objects with ever increasing nuance. And we gain the direction of evolution is toward being able to respond to increasing complexity in life with increasing Mm. nuance. This is a fascinating uh, issue because it, it seems that there is a limit to the human minds as complex and incredible as it is. It's uh, there's a limit, the degree to which we can handle ever increasing complexity. And there's also the, uh, we might say, uh, option at any given moment to return to original nature, which would be, a, let's say, a, a counterpoint to this ever more nuanced examination I, of objects. I right? wouldn't say, I wouldn't say so. Oh, okay. What would you say? Well, one is I would say the whole idea of return is a true but partial perspective. Return is certainly the emphasis of Buddhism and Taoism um, and merging with, but I'm not talking about, so merging with is a foundation for what I'm talking about. And I would say that, um, yeah, I, I would say return always only gets us so far. 
So we have to make a distinction, Noah, between the simplicity prior to complexity and the simplicity after complexity. A distinction between the infant and the sage in the Tao Te Ching, mm -hmm. a distinction between the simplicity before complexity and the simplicity after complexity. So Bruce Lee said, when I first started studying martial arts, a punch was just a punch and a kick was just a kick. And then when I became very, very serious, there were a thousand nuances to punching and kicking. But now that I've got it, a punch is a punch and a kick is just a kick. And we don't want to conflate the capacity of the sage to cognize and respond to a post-personal, transpersonal, intersubjective complexity with the, with the greatly um, relatively more insignificant capacities of the infant who is in, embedded in that complexity but has no objective relationship to it. So, so, so I would make a distinction between the human mind, which you posited as limited in its capacity to respond to complexity, and consciousness. And I understand and define in my own work the human mind as an evolutionarily evolved mechanism that orients human beings in time and space through the storage and retrieval of memory in the form of thought, feeling, emotion, and sensation. And that human mm -hmm. mind is limited. That human mind is, although it's very good to be oriented in time and space. And we should note that not all of what's been taught to us by culture is bad. It is really good that we all agree to go at green and stop at red. And it's very good for a six-year-old to know when their ball rolls into a street, they should stop at the curb and look both ways before they run in, into the street to get the ball. So I would say that the human mind in its capacity to orient us in time and straight space through the storage and retrieval of information is an object itself that appears to us in consciousness through contemplative and, med and meditative practices. The human mind becomes a structure that we can see. And we can actually see and learn objectively how it works and what it does so that when it works and when it's acting, we, rather than being compelled by the conclusions it draws, we are free in the face of its compulsion to actually decide what we want to do based on higher and deeper values. So while the human mind might be limited in its capacity to respond to complexity, I would say I, I at least endeavor to live in a context having no inherent limitation regarding what, what level of capacity and nuance a human being can comprehend and respond to. It's just the mind offers us a necessary but limited contribution in that regard. But we, we also have a soul and a conscience and an ego and a superego and um, an authentic self. And emptiness is a dimension of the self. Luminosity is a dimension of the self. And I would not bet on any inherent limit in the capacity of consciousness to cognize itself. And so when I say that, what I'm saying is I understand the entire mode of force of human evolution to be the question, who am I? And the entire universe enterprise for the last 15 billion years or so of universal evolution to be really the generation of a body for consciousness to come to know itself through. And I would, I, would, I would be humble enough to never presuppose any limit to the capacity of consciousness to know itself. And I would probably suggest at least that occurs to me as an endless and infinite task of which we appear to be if not the leading vehicle in the universe at this moment, certainly the leading one that we're aware of. 
Well, it seems that there's always going to be some limit on the capacity of consciousness to perceive itself because there is that uh, component of emptiness there, which which I think you identify as uh, this in, in essence, like a not knowing associated with the water element, uh, well, which is well, well, in some sense, kind of the 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 root. That's the the root. Um, organ system the kidney well in any moment there in any moment there's certainly in every moment is imbued with mystery <laughs> and in every moment no matter how much we know there is a mystery at the heart of all things and there's a degree to which we're unconscious but but consci that consciousness exists in a evolutionary stream on a trajectory toward ever greater knowing. And that, that's the direction of evolution. So I'm not suggesting that in one moment, all can be known. But what I'm suggesting is that the direction of, of conscious evolution is toward ever greater integration of the nervous system. You know, I mean, it's not nature that's building the next human being. And then it's not nature that's creating, I mean, this is interesting. Huh. It's not nature that's creating the next vehicle for the evolution of consciousness. It's us. Yeah. And, and we are nature. Right. So, yeah. So you're, what you seem to be hinting at there is what might be called the transhumanist project. And I was actually going to ask you even before then, whether you think that it's some extension of the human nervous system, such as an AI system that may actually be the next evolution of consciousness. Well. I think that it probably likely that's correct. And as Ken Wilber points out, and I think the point is well made, the sad thing about it is all we have is deficient mental rational people like Elon Musk designing the technology. So, <laughs> so, so when you talk about downloading human intelligence to main, mainframes, the human intelligence <laughs> that they want to download to mainframes and the people who want to do it uh, is, is, the in, is the intelligence that is deficient, mental, rational, and is destroying the planet. I would think of uh, Ray Kurzweil as being more deficient than Elon, but uh, what is, what's your, just out of curiosity, what's your sense of Elon's uh, primary deficiencies? Well, well, you know, I haven't put a great deal into this. Ray, Ray Kurzweil lives in my town here. Did you know that in Richmond? No, I didn't know that. But you know, Ray Kurzweil designed the Kurzweil synthesizer, which I was intimately yes. familiar with. It was like my bread and butter for many years. I have one, and the, the man's fantasies where technology is taking us is the most dystopian nightmare that one could ever imagine. Absolutely. It's uh, so dismayed to discover the direction he went. And I, I just see Elon Musk as... Um, 50,000 satellites into the orbit to beam 5G down on everyone in the world. I think his fantasy is that technology is going to save us. And I really think, while technology, I think, is going to be imperative in saving us, it's really the, the evolution of consciousness to wisely use that technology. And this is the moment where we had yet another technical issue. And so basically the conversation drew to a close, although there were a couple of other things that got said. My audio all of a sudden got extremely weird. So you're going to hear me uh, basically thanking Lonnie for being on the show here. Here we go. Okay. Thank you so much for, for the time. I really appreciate you appearing on the show, and I really am a fan of your work. It's incredibly interesting and deep. I encourage everyone to look you up. LonnieJarrett.com, L-O-N-N-Y-J-A-R-R-E-T-T.com. And to uh, learn more about it, and I hope that at some point or another we'd be able to uh, have another conversation. Thank you. Anytime, no one. Please point people toward my things. And to anyone listening, um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. And Noah, as ever, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. We look forward to serving you again soon. In the meantime, remember... 
turn that thing over a few times before you pick it up and take it home. <laughs>